The summer flounder, or fluke, is probably the most celebrated saltwater species in our tri-state waters. It brings fun and excitement as well as a ton of revenue to our fisheries from May through September. Whether we target them from land or sea, they are certainly one of the most enjoyable species to catch, and arguably one of the most underappreciated game fish in our waters. This is largely because little is known about their behavior, particularly near our beaches. One such area of mystery is how they move underwater. Over the past year and a half, I've had the fortunate opportunity to observe fluke underwater. Through this experience, I've developed a deep appreciation for how uniquely they are built and how they move. So let's get under the hood and dive into the locomotion of the summer flounder and how that might give you an edge when targeting them from land. First, we need to understand the environment surrounding our beaches. This begins with some basic terminology about life on the seabed versus life above it. Starting with the seabed, we enter what is known as the benthic zone, the ecological region at the bottom of a body of water. The word originates from the Greek benthos, meaning depths. Footage from documentaries like Blue Planet shines a light on the strange and diverse life that inhabits the deep sea floor. And while our coastal beaches might seem very different, they share similar ecological dynamics. Benthic creatures, those living on or in the bottom of aquatic environments, exhibit a wide range of movement strategies. Some crawl, some burrow, some float just above the bottom, and others attach themselves to surfaces. The type of movement depends on the organism's morphology, habit, and environmental conditions. Take hermit crabs for an example. They are common in our waters and spend almost their entire lives on the seabed. Unlike their sideways sculling cousins, hermit crabs walk forward across the seafloor, constantly searching for food and empty shells to inhabit. It's not uncommon to see a congregation of hermit crabs in a patch of seabed engaged in what I would like to describe as a shell meetup, swapping and sizing up new homes. These crabs rarely rise above even minor seabed features like sand ripples. Another example is the sand flea, or mole crab, a small sand burn crustacean just a few inches long. They live primarily in the beach's swash zone, the area where the waves rush up and recede back down to the shore. Unlike hermit crabs, sand fleas have a football-shaped body and move by darting and swimming backwards in short bursts, often popping out of the burrows and then quickly burrowing again to feed with their antennae. Then there are mussels, bivalve mollusks, aka shellfish, that live almost entirely on the bottom, binding themselves to each other or to harsh structures like rock jetties, shell beds, and underwater boulders. Mussels are natural water filters. One mussel can filter up a bathtub's worth of seawater per day. Though they remain fixed along the seabed, their ecological contributions extend well above the benthic zone into the water column. This brings us to the pelagic zone, the counterpart to the benthic region. The pelagic zone refers to the open ocean environment, away from the shore and seafloor. It spans the entire water column and is further divided into subzones based on depth, each with unique conditions in marine life. Even in the shallow waters near our beaches, the pelagic zone exists above the seafloor, although it's a much more crowded space due to the overlap with the benthic region. Game fish, such as striped bass and bluefish, often cruise through the area, hunting bait fish that live in both zones. One common example is the finger mullet, which school along the shoreline from late summer to fall, feeding on algae in detritus as they prepare for their southerly migration. Fluke. Benthic by nature, pelagic by aspiration. Now here's where things get interesting. Fluke are primarily benthic, but exhibit pelagic tendencies. Like other flounders, they are flatfish with both eyes on one side of their body, oriented to look upward rather than outward. Their movement is a unique combination of crawling along the bottom with their fins and hopping from one patch of seabed to another. Their horizontally aligned spine gives them a certain advantages and disadvantages. For instance, fluke excel at vertical movement. They can cover a surprising amount of vertical distance in short bursts. This makes them especially effective ambush predators, capable of rising quickly to attack prey and then ducking back down to the bottom. However, this same body design limits their lateral movement, their ability to shift left or right 
is less fluid due to the inverted spine. So when you consider all of this, it's easy to appreciate how Fluke are uniquely adapted for vertical superiority. And while they spend most of their lives on the bottom, they don't hesitate to enter the pelagic zone in pursuit of prey. During the late summer peanut bunker run, for instance, you can sometimes witness Fluke chasing bait fish near the surface in a blitz-like frenzy. In essence, Fluke are benthic by nature, but aspire to be all zone predators, which makes them remarkably versatile and, in my opinion, underappreciated. A dive with Walter the Fluke. Here's some footage I was lucky enough to capture during recent dives. I visited the same stretch of beach on consecutive days and encountered the same fluke twice. Let's give him the name Walter. Unlike most fluke, which tend to flee or stay buried, Walter was curious. When I swam over him, he didn't dart away. Instead, he methodically swam below me as if he were to size me up. I didn't expect to keep up with the fluke in the current, but somehow I did. As you'll see in the footage, I was stunning him just as much as he was stunning me. Walter gave us plenty of clues about fluke movement. You can see him tilting upward and side to side to get a better view of me. But you also notice his limitation in lateral movement. He has to twist and torque his body and fins to turn. It's not a natural movement for a fish built like that. Where fluke truly excel is in short straight line bursts and vertical movements. These traits are key to understanding how they hunt and attack prey, something I explore in detail in my Fluke Geek course, link in the description below. One last insight. One often overlooked aspect of Fluke behavior is how intuitively connected they are to the seabed. In many of my dives, it was clear that Fluke have an incredible sense of where they want to end up after an attack. Their awareness of the terrain is integral to both their hunting strategy and escape maneuvers. That's all for this video. I hope you've gained a deeper understanding of the underwater world that Fluke inhabit, their mastery of the benthic zone, combined with their ability to venture into the pelagic, gives them a unique set of traits that few other fish possess.